we're going to look at Peter preaching the gospel, giving reasons for faith, and giving people an, an opportunity to, to respond. And certainly, the way that Dr. Min shared the gospel in that way, he was doing that very same thing. He was giving reasons. It was in a winsome way. Uh, he was convin convincing. He was doing it with great courage uh, in many of the ways that, uh, that Peter is here uh, in this message. And what we are seeing is the, uh, the outcome of what we studied last week. Jesus said, again, our key verse for the book, the book is whole outline, based on verse 8 of chapter 1, but the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you shall be my witnesses, both here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, the Holy Spirit has come upon them. We saw that last week. And now Peter is doing that. Now he's been equipped. He's been given the power of the Holy Spirit to actually uh, be that witness for Jesus Christ. Again, this is the same uh, Pay no attention to this person on my left at all. <laughs> I'll just keep going here for the sake of time. But uh, again, Peter has been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's gone from, uh, with the other disciples, being locked in an upper room, fearing for his own life, assuming that because they took his leader, uh, that he was a follower of Jesus, and tortured him uh, and killed him, the same thing could happen to them. Of course, then we have the appearances of Jesus in terms of the resurrection uh, and then the promise uh, uh, at his ascension to wait into Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit would come. And now it has come, and Peter goes from being, well, he's still the big fisherman, uh, but he goes from uh, being afraid uh, and discouraged uh, to having the ability to preach a sermon like this. And we might also uh, add the fact that as far as he knew, it was going to be his first and his last. Because he didn't know the outcome of this message. Uh, he wasn't there about ready to preach. He wasn't beforehand saying to the other apostles, you see these notes here? They'll be cut to the heart. Watch this. He, he wasn't doing that. As far as he knew, he was going to get up, trust the Lord to give him a couple of scriptures to share uh, as he presented the gospel uh, and just trusted the Lord for the outcome. So it was uh, certainly a hostile situation he was uh, sharing in, uh, and he's doing it in response to, to questions. The whole thing begins uh, when they said in verse 12, what does this mean? In other words, they've been attracted to the area because they heard a sound like a violent uh, wind uh, that was going on. That was one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Uh, they probably didn't see, or maybe they did. We don't know. It doesn't really say what appeared to be. Uh, tongues of fire. It wasn't fire, but there was an appearance of fire, uh, again, signaling God's presence upon them, not just Peter, not just the apostles, but everybody that was uh, in that upper room, all 120. And of course, then they began to speak in a language that they didn't know, but people there gathered from 15 regions around the Roman world could hear them in their own language declaring the wonders of God. You know, what does this mean? And then Peter gave the explanation we looked at that last week and said how important it is when there is a spiritual phenomena to be able to give a scriptural context for it, and he does. This was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Uh, the Holy Spirit is being poured out. It's being poured out now, and it's going to continue until Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth at the end of what we call the tribulation period. So he gives it a scriptural context, uh, and now he begins, in a sense, to give them the gospel. Give them an explanation. They all know that Jesus of Nazareth has been crucified. They've probably heard rumors of his resurrection, but they've also heard the official explanation. The apostles stole his body. Which is it? What is really going on? And Peter's going to address those issues and try to answer their questions. He does it uh, in giving four reasons for faith. And uh, we'll begin reading in chapter 2, verse 22. Peter, his words here. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. 
You have made known to me the ways of life. Uh, you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ, Messiah, to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, <laughs> being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord uh, and Christ. So four reasons he's giving. Uh, and of course, uh, these would not necessarily be reasons you and I would give to our friends and neighbors. Unless they're Jewish, then they'd be really good reasons. But either way, we can learn from them. We talk about the fact that the book of Acts is full of models and examples, and this is a great model. It's a great model for preaching the gospel. If you listen to an older Billy Graham crusade, you listen to a guy like Greg Laurie, Franklin Graham, uh, and an evangelist that go in, you can almost follow their outline. They will use this as an outline for presenting the gospel. Pretty good for the big fisherman in his, uh, his first sermon. Uh, he says, uh, again, the first reason he gives for faith well as the person of Christ himself. Uh, the testimony of the miracles, that's in verse 22. He says he was a man attested by God too by miracles, wonders, uh, and signs which God did through him in your midst as yourself know. They all knew. Jesus healed thousands of people. I mean, it would, it's not a big country. It'd be, it'd be hard-pressed for someone to not know someone that got healed at, uh, uh, at some point in time, especially if you lived in northern Israel, the Galilee area. They all had to know somebody that was healed. They all had, had to have heard the stories of people being raised from the dead, feeding the 5,000, uh, and so forth. Uh, it was on CNN every night, these things that were going on. Maybe not. Maybe only on Fox. I'm not sure. But everybody knew, uh, either way, what was going on. Accredited means uh, demonstrated. Jesus demonstrated over and over again. Again, this is part of our study in Matthew right now on, uh, on Wednesday nights. Uh, the accreditation, we might say, or the testimony that Jesus was the Messiah. Everything the Messiah was to do, could only do, uh, Jesus did. Uh, and, and Peter is giving this for a reason for faith. Why should you put your faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah? Because of all the miracles uh, that he did. Uh, and then he brings in this idea that... Uh, He's fulfilling prophecy in this, and he's following God's will, doing these things, well, even to the point of his death. He says the death of Jesus was according to God's plan. Sometimes we ask the question, uh, who killed uh, Jesus? And of course, we know it was the Romans, so let's get the Italians. No, uh, the Romans certainly carried it out, uh, but it was uh, at the orders of the will of the Sanhedrin, which was the corrupt Jewish leadership ruling in Jerusalem uh, at that time. We also know the, claim, the crowd there claimed responsibility. In Matthew's Gospel, in, in chapter 27, verse 25, they said, and all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Might have regretted that just a little bit. And you can understand Jesus from the cross, you know, basically saying, Forgive them. They absolutely don't know what they're saying here or what they're doing. And, and of course, they, uh, they did it. Because uh, a sin committed in omission could be forgiven. A sin committed by commission could not. So Jesus says, don't leave this to their charge. It was God's plan all along. Verse 23 again, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. It was always God's plan. Uh, was the crowd responsible? Yes, they were. Was the Sanhedrin responsible? Yes, they were. Did the Romans carry it out? Yes, they did. Was it all of our sin that placed him on the cross? Yes, it was. And it was God's plan to do so all along. This is Peter's point to help them understand. If Jesus is the Messiah, what's up with him dying on the cross? Why didn't he bring in his kingdom? Again, these are maybe not always relevant answers to uh, your, your car mechanic, but they are very important answers to be given to first century Jews and Jewish people of, of today. Uh, John writing in the book of uh, Revelation, 
in chapter 13, verse 8, is really making reference to the false Messiah that will rule during that time. But he makes an interesting statement about Jesus nonetheless. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, this false Messiah, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John is saying that Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain for our sins, well, from the foundation of the world. It was always God's plan. It was by his predetermined purpose that he did it. Uh, Jesus talks about the fact that he gives his life freely in John's gospel. He says, therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Isaiah the prophet, prophesying hundreds of years before about the Messiah when he comes, he prophesies of what we call the suffering servant. Now, it's interesting, uh, you know, Jewish people today, Israel today, uh, has to take this passage and basically decide that it can't be talking about a person, even though there's lots of personal pronouns throughout the whole thing. And they have to attribute it to something else, the nation of Israel or something else. They don't quite know what to do with it. A lot of Jewish people have read this passage and come to faith in Jesus Christ because in one sense, in verse 10, it says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. It was God's will to crush him, the Messiah, and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He's going to resurrect and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper uh, in his hands. It was all according to God's plan. Peter is trying to explain to them. We saw last week that Jesus died right on Passover, fulfilling that feast. He then rose again on Sunday, fulfilling the feast of first fruits. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost, again on a Sunday. Jesus rising on the Sunday uh, and fulfilling the feast of, of Pentecost as well. All of this in sync, according to God's plan, to the exact detail. Uh, and yet, at the same time, uh, it's all God's predetermined plan. But he brings into it Peter, the big fisherman, not the theologian, says in verse 23, but you guys, <laughs> you've taken by lawless hands and have crucified uh, and put to death. Peter, in his first sermon, brings together two huge theological issues. What really is it? Is it God's sovereignty or is it man's free will? <laughs> Peter says it's both. Uh, it was God's predetermined plan, but guess what? God still holds us personally responsible because he gives us a free will. It's both of these things. Appreciate uh, uh, Spurgeon's comment in one of his sermons. He says, the predestination of God does not alter the moral quality of the acts of wicked men. Men acts freely, as freely as if there were no divine predestination. Yet the free agency of man does not affect the foreknowledge and predestination of God, said from a Calvinist, <laughs> who says, yeah, but there's still free will. They're, they're still both. I'm glad he agrees with Peter. <laughs> that's what we're trying to do. When we come to a passage that teaches God's sovereignty, that's what we teach. When we come to a passage that teaches man's free will, that's what we teach. Call is crazy, but it's in the Bible. You know, again, uh, 1,500 years of argument over this. We just try to stick with what the Scripture says. It teaches both, and Peter brings both together in the same passage. Was it God's predetermined will to send Jesus to die on the cross for all of our sins? Yes, it was. It was his predetermined will to do that. Were the people that executed him still held responsible? Yes, they were. And people are still held responsible today who reject that sacrifice for their sins uh, in God's love. Uh, the first reason Peter gives, well, it's, it's the person of Christ himself, <coughs> unique, even as we've already heard in that testimony in, uh, in one of the plays. Unique because he fulfilled scripture, attested by miracles, accredited himself to be the only person that could be the Messiah. Uh, and of course, his second reason, very important for faith, well, the promise of the resurrection. Prophecy is fulfilled. Peter here quotes David from Psalm 16, verse 8 to 11. And he points out that these verses cannot possibly, uh, uh, again, apply to David. Uh, here he's quoting the passage uh, that talks about the fact that, uh, verse 27, uh, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, or, or Sheol in the, in the Hebrew, or the grave. David is saying, uh, and you will not leave my soul in the grave. And, uh, and Peter's gone, 
I think we have a problem here because uh, you might recall David's tomb is right down over there, right down the street there. Still there today in Jerusalem. You can see it. King David. His soul is still there. So apparently he wasn't talking about himself because he's still there. He had to be talking about somebody else. He had to be prophesying, speaking of a future event, a future person, uh, the Messiah. Well, we know that from verse 27. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. David sure isn't talking about himself. The Holy One is a term for the Messiah. David predicted the Messiah would come. Uh, he would die, but he would not remain in the grave. His body would not see any decay at all. He would be resurrected. David still in his tomb. Can't be talking about himself. He predicted the Messiah's death and resurrection. So that answers a pretty good question. If I'm Jewish, how is it the Messiah comes? All the promises about him setting up his kingdom, but he dies. I don't really get that. No, actually, the scripture said that all along. Isaiah prophesied it. David spelled it out in Psalm 22. And right here, the answer he gives them, well, it was a good answer for what they needed to hear. The person of Christ was reason number one. The promise of the resurrection was the second reason. And then the ascension of Christ was, well, he says that was actually predicted as well. Uh, that's in verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet... Uh, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body according to his flesh, one of his physical descendants, uh, would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. A physical descendant of David uh, would be resurrected, the Messiah, the Christ, and he would actually rise and sit on the throne next to God. Uh, that's his second point here. The ascension of Jesus was actually uh, predicted. Now, Peter didn't get this reasoning, certainly, from himself. And he certainly is being empowered in terms of a boldness and a courage uh, from the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, but these are scriptures that are in his mind, and this one in particular. Well, he heard Jesus use it brilliantly with the Pharisees. In fact, Jesus used it so well, they stopped ask, asking any questions after this. Recorded in Matthew 22, verse 41. There it says, while the Pharisees gathered together, Jesus asked them classic rabbinical style. Uh, you make your point by asking a question. Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Messiah, or Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? Saying, and then he quotes this psalm, Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. You got any other bright ideas? I thought we had them with that one. You know, I'm not asking that guy anything. Makes fools of us every time. And they just kind of leave. Uh, because he comes back to them. Whose son, uh, and, and who's the, you know, is David's son going to be the Messiah? Of course he's going to be the Messiah. Well, let me ask you this. When David writes Psalm 110, David says, the Lord said to my Lord. How can he be speaking about himself? Again, King David. Would King David say to his great-grandson, for example, some little kid, Lord, I say to you, Lord. No, he would never do that. He would never do that. So who's David talking to then? If he's got a physical descendant that he says, you are the Lord, that means his physical descendant is the Messiah, and he's going to address him one day as the Lord. The Lord is going to say to his physical descendant, sit here next to me on my throne until I make your enemies a footstool. Did David predict that the Christ would be, die and rise again? Yes, he did. Did he predict that then he would rise and sit on the throne of God? One of the things that got to got Jesus in a lot of hot water when he's before the high priest because he mentioned the fact that he would do that. He says, but David predicted that all along. Again, uh, you know, the guy that's uh, working in your garden outside, this may not mean a lot to him that David predicted the ascension of Christ to the throne, but again, it was very relative to where they were. And any Jewish people you may know today, <laughs> this is a wonderful sermon to take them to, uh, to help them understand, because it's a big issue. When the Messiah comes, how is it that he could be killed? I don't understand this because we expected his kingdom. Reason number three, the ascension of Christ was predicted. Reason number four, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 33, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see uh, in here. 
uh, this uh, spiritual phenomena that was taking uh, place. They heard the mighty wind, the sound of the mighty wind. They heard them speaking in languages they did not know. It was a language they didn't know, but other people could hear it. They were declaring the wonders of God. I don't know if they saw the, the, uh, the presence of, of God over them as in the tongues of fire or not, but obviously something supernatural was, uh, was going on. And Peter uses that to help them understand. Jesus promised that when he ascended to the Father, once he was there, then he would send the Holy Spirit. This is obvious. He sent the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he must be there. If Jesus is still in the grave, he can't ascend to the throne. If, he, if he's not in, at the throne, then what's the explanation for this? But there's something going on here, phenomenal to them. They couldn't understand it, but he was able to go delve right into their own hearts and minds of wow, this is all really bothering me and this whole thing. What is the explanation for this? And he was able to give an explanation for it to them, uh, the presence uh, of the Holy Spirit. Peter's conclusion was both a declaration uh, and notice an accusation. We might call it the punchline, verse 36. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In other words, by the way, did I mention the fact that you just uh, just committed the greatest crime of all history? Uh, your Messiah came to you. Your king came to you uh, with nothing but love and peace and healing. And you took him and you had him tortured and nailed to a Roman cross. Oh, by the way, at this point, uh, these men are wondering only one thing. Is there any hope for us? They had, had, didn't need to be convinced uh, any further. And as we know from reading, as we'll read a, uh, in a moment, it wasn't just a couple of them. It was like 3,000 of them. Uh, and we know within a very short period of time, there are tens of thousands of believers in Jerusalem as they hear these kinds of reasons and these scriptures so they can put it together uh, and understand who Jesus is. Giving reasons for faith is important, and certainly we need to be ready to do that ourselves. It may not be these kinds of reasons. People have lots of different questions uh, and those questions deserve to be answered. And we're going to go back and look at uh, five things we need to do uh, to respond to those around us. But secondly, very important, Peter gives an opportunity to respond in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this present uh, perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added uh, to them. So the response, he gives them a chance to respond, which is very important. Uh, and they responded because they were convicted of their sins. Quite the line there, they were cut to the heart. And uh, sometimes I think that's, that's lacking some to a bit. I mean, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it should be because we're cut to the heart. That all of a sudden, I get it. This makes sense. Uh, it's my sin that put him there. I am lost I, uh, without him. My only hope is if Jesus Christ will uh, will forgive me. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, I grew up in, in, in the church and stuff. A lot of churches used to have this little altar area across the front. And, uh, uh, and it was a place where people would actually weep and mourn because they didn't know if God would really forgive them or not. And so they cried out uh, until they believed that they were actually forgiven. It's interesting to read some of the stories of early revivals in, in, uh, in this country that shaped and, uh, and changed our nation on a couple of occasions. Uh, you know, we, we sometimes we make it all, all too simple, you know. Uh, just so just kind of raise your hand or, you know, whatever it is. We've got the big rainbow. Just walk from one side of the rainbow to the other side of the rainbow. I'm not making this up. But, uh, you know, these things that, that go on. But these guys uh, is, are cut to the heart. Their only question was, would God forgive them? Is there any hope for them? And you can, and uh, that, that would be a reasonable conclusion to come to. If you're, if you're one of these guys standing there, two months ago you were maybe in the crowd 
uh, at least some of your friends and neighbor were, and you watched him go down that street carrying the cross, beat to a pole, nailed the cross, and then you figure out, oh, by the way, that was that was the Messiah. We did that too, uh, which is now well, he's God and he's on the throne, and we're pretty much toast here unless there's some by his grace he might forgive us. Uh, they were cut to the heart. Uh, they had put the Lord of glory uh, to death. But of course, uh, they needed to then, with that conviction, repent, recognize, uh, turn from their sins. Repentance means to change their mind. Uh, they thought something about Jesus before, and they changed their mind, and they think something differently about him now. What well, was different? They agreed with God <laughs> that they were lost in their sins, and Christ was their only hope. Uh, they were cut to the heart. They repented of their sins. That's what it takes to be saved. Because of that, then, because of that, Peter challenged them, secondly, uh, to be baptized. Again, it was proof of them, their sincer sincerity and their repentance. And sometimes people ask, well, how did that work, baptizing 3,000 people? That must have taken a while, but not really in, uh, in Israel. And we've been there, and it's uh, very excavated around the temple uh, area. There's lots of mikvahs where uh, basically you would get baptized every time you went to make a sacrifice in the temple. So the idea of baptism is, uh, is very common. You got baptized if you proselytized into Judaism because you had to walk through and uh, you're saying, I'm saying goodbye to my old life. I'm embracing a new life. Um, the, what, what all of this is, uh, what, is my body is being cleansed. It's significant of something going on internally. And actually, the Roman and the Greek religions had very similar. Everybody in this culture understood what baptism uh, is uh, and what it's all about. And so uh, when he said, you need to be baptized, they're like, they're, they're on it. And uh, these are these uh, mikvahs are uh, wide enough. There's steps going down uh, into it and steps going up the other side. You can put four or five guys in a row. They can just walk through and walk up the other side. And there's many of them. They probably baptized 3,000 guys in an hour. It was there really a problem or an issue? Uh, but that's how they did it. Uh, and it was significant because they were saying something uh, about their lives uh, that was uh, radically uh, changed. It really spoke of a commitment to, uh, to Christ. Uh, it, uh, I, I think it's got a pretty powerful message these days. You know, there was a time, uh, you know, in this country. I remember, you know, growing up in the church. It was like, uh, you know, when you graduated from high school, there would always be... Uh, uh, you know, a party at somebody's house on graduation night, and it would usually be somebody that had a pool, because if you grew up in the church and you're graduating, then on that night, you got baptized, whether you wanted to or not. <laughs> you're not going to be the kid that goes, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. All 14 other people are, but uh, kind of a holdout here. No, you just, it's a lot, you find that it's a lot easier just to go along with the program. And uh, why cause problems? We're having a party here tonight, and there's like uh, 92 tacos inside waiting for me. So just get me in the water and get me out again. Nobody thought anything of it. I think it's a bigger deal now. I think, it's, I think people think through uh, about being baptized. Now, when we go down to the beach, it's a public thing. A lot of people are like, wow, I wonder what they're kind of doing there, ducking those people in the water. But there's other people we've found over the years that they know exactly what we're doing. And they remember those images. And maybe they were baptized themselves at one time. Or they, their mom was, or their dad was, and they've seen it. And they kind of understand. It kind of opens the door for lots of uh, witnessing opportunities. But that's the idea. The person is saying, in a very public way, I now am a new creature in Christ. The old has passed away, and the new has come. I have been cleansed of my sin. And as Paul says, when I go in that water, it's like I'm going in the grave. And when I'm coming out of that water, it's like I'm resurrected because that's exactly what's going to happen to me one day. And he challenged them to be baptized. He could only do that, though, because they were convicted of their sin and because they repented of their sin and placed their faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, one thing just to clear up, a little theological issue. <clears throat> when he says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, uh, the, the for there in the Greek is a reference to the repent and not to be baptized. If you read it in English, it sounds like you get baptized so that your sins can be forgiven. No, we get baptized because our sins have been forgiven. Uh, not everybody has the opportunity, uh, again, because of different issues. 
but uh, everybody should uh, be baptized. Every Christian should be baptized. It's just what you do. Remember, it was in, uh, uh, in the end of Matthew's Gospel in uh, Matthew 28 where Jesus gave, gave the great suggestion. I think that was the commission. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son uh, and, the, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so they did, and, and, and so should we. If you, uh, and, uh, you know, we've had just some wonderful, wonderful baptisms. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you know, this is some of the... Some of the kids in the church that uh, that have you know come to faith in Christ uh, pretty early on have a, definitely a relationship and a, and a walk with the Lord and and uh, you know somebody asked me one time I, you know don't you think some of these kids are uh, a little young to be getting baptized and I don't know who it was and uh, uh, it was one of Tom and Emily's boys and I I said well you know I think he's like nine or ten uh, I know he's read the Bible several times through he's got major portions of Scripture memorized. I think he's read most of it. Have you read Fox's Book of Martyrs? Have you read? Well, yeah, he's read the Pilgrim's Rock. You haven't got well. Yeah, he's read all of those. Uh, he's helping out in the church. He's always here for the work days. Uh, which which part of this? I, I don't understand. He's been a Christian for a couple of years. I, I've delayed the thing for a few years. You think it's too early? I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's it's where the person's heart is at. On the other spectrum, I get to baptize Charlie at 92. You're never never too old. That's, that's my record there so far. See if anyone else over 92 comes to faith in Christ. But uh, uh, never, never too young, in a sense, once you've repented uh, and come, come to the Lord. Never, never too old. Uh, sometimes it's tough because of, uh, you know, physical limitations. Uh, I remember a uh, young guy we did uh, with Pastor Bill when I was uh, still in town. Uh, former Coast Guard officer, went to the academy, very fit, very shocked guy, got cancer. Uh, a couple of rounds of chemo, and now he's in a wheelchair. He weighs about 275 plus. Uh, I'd go by and, uh, and pick him up. He had his own little van <laughs> set up, and uh, you know, I'd jump in his van, drive him, to, uh, drive him to church, and uh, and everything. And he was able to, for maybe the last two three months uh, of his life, uh, come and fellowship with us and uh, sit under the teaching. But wanted to be baptized. I mean, a little bit. It's like, well, you know, you got an IV, and you know, you're good. You know. <laughs> No, I want to be baptized. Okay, we make this happen. <laughs> we just need uh, four, four, five, six guys, and we uh, Kapilani picked him up, wheelchair and all, and took him right down to the edge of the water. <laughs> Roll, tipped him over backwards. Bill had a big, uh, a big bowl of water. We uh, dumped it on him and prayed that he didn't get infected from the <coughs> the water and so forth. But he got baptized. Uh, it's important. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know where you're at, and I, I just tell you, a lot of times people come to faith in Christ. Uh, we don't teach this enough and make this enough of an issue, and so you can be a, a Christian for sometimes a number of years and never be baptized. Uh, but it's the evidence of your sincerity to follow Jesus Christ and what He's done. So it's uh, it's it's important. Well, let's come back to this idea of principles for reaching others with the gospel. As I as I mentioned before, and here's where the, kind of the application is here. Again, these reasons may not be the good reasons you need to give uh, to others, but there's still a model here. The first one is people have a right to ask questions. They said, what does this mean? Uh, and and uh, he gave them a, a scriptural, a very legitimate answer. First Peter 3, 15, the, kind of the classic verse on, on apologetics. Be ready always to give everybody an answer, a reason, a reasonable answer. Uh, for the for the hope that lies within, and do it with gentleness and with meekness, not to win an argument because you're smarter than the other guy, but to try to win them over. And people ask lots of different kind of questions sometimes as we begin to share them. And sometimes your best answer is this: You know what? I don't know the answer to that, but that is an awesome question, and I'm going to find the answer and get back to you on that. Sometimes that's your best answer. If you don't know, you don't know, and that's okay. But say, you'll find out. Because you know why? There is an answer. You know, whatever the question is, there is an answer. Uh, and we talk about all the time that Christianity, by its very nature, is evidential. God himself is constantly saying, I will show you by doing this. I will prove to you by doing this. Uh, and he gives us reasons. These guys had questions. Peter says, there's a reason for that. Remember what David said? Remember what David said? There's a reasonable explanation for what's going on. 
uh, people have a right to ask questions, which means we need to be good listeners. <laughs> you know, slow, slow to speak, you know, slow to become angry. Uh, be good listeners. Secondly, Peter appealed to the things that they knew, as we've already mentioned. Now, we're going to see uh, in Acts 17, the Apostle Paul there at the Areopagus on Mars Hill do the same thing. Uh, he's going to walk in, and our only sermon that we've got given to a Gentile audience uh, in the book of Acts, he's going to talk about the fact that I've been all over town and seen that you are very religious people. Because <laughs> he said the town was, uh, at the time, Matthew was full of idols every, everywhere he went. He, he could have just ripped into them. I can see that you're a very deceived people and you have uh, ignorant ideas about God because you're worshiping these stupid idols. Paul doesn't start that way. Neither, I've heard people do similar. Uh, neither should we. It's, hey, I can tell you're a very, very religious person. And, uh, and Paul says that to them. And I notice there's an idol over here to the unknown God. And I want to tell you about the unknown God. And then he even quotes their own Greek poets to them. Paul, again, is able to draw from, not only was he a great rabbinical scholar, but he got raised in a, in a, in a Greek setting uh, as well. And he knew both. And he was able to give testimony to these guys. He appealed to the things that they knew. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's just, you know, simple stuff for you. Like, uh, do you go to church? That's not a tough question. You know, it's like, Sure, if I have to have a theological degree to ask that. No, do you go to, do you grow up going to church? Uh, you're just you, you meet somebody. Yeah, what they're what Peter's doing, what Paul did is trying to build a bridge to them. You know, what's the interest? You know, talk to them, listen to them, and find some way to build a bridge. We call it, call it sometimes getting from small talk to big talk. Jesus was, uh, of course, the great uh, the great teacher, uh, and we could use many examples. But uh, he was able to talk to the Samaritan woman at the well. Different culture completely, but he was able to come up and, and just make a comment about uh, getting some water. And pretty soon he's talking about living water and giving an explanation for who he was as the Messiah. He was able to build a bridge and then get it from small talk uh, to big talk. And uh, Paul was able to do that. Peter was able to do this. Uh, and here's, uh, again, just so important, a couple other tips. Uh, have you seen the Hobbit movie? There's, there's a few lines to see the Hobbit movie. Going tomorrow, don't tell me anything. Uh, and just, yeah, that's, you like it? Oh, that's a great movie. It's written by a Christian, you know. You're kidding. No, teach biblical concepts. I mean, you can just talk to him about, about Tolkien and, and his work. Yeah, he had another good friend who was a Christian. This guy named C.S. Lewis. Ever hear of them? Chronicles of Narnia? Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, that guy's a Christian too. Really? Yeah. Aslan? That's a picture of Jesus. Remember the beginning? The lion dies to save the lives of the kids. That's what Jesus did for us. That's just finding out where people are at and trying to build, build a, bridge, uh, real, uh, a bridge to them. Uh, third, his address was an orderly uh, uh, statement of the truth. And again, I don't think Peter took a homiletics class, but pretty good outline. Uh, he, it wasn't just random. It just wasn't random thoughts. It was very orderly. Uh, and we can follow that as we share with others. But the only way we can do that is if we actually prepare. Uh, when you have the opportunity to give that 90-second testimony, can you do it? Or a five-minute testimony, if you got five minutes. No, but give me an hour and a half, and I'm good. You see, because I was brought up, and, you know, one time I heard the guy on the I, I didn't like the guy on the TV. You know, he, he had a funny accent, and not, it was like, no. You know, it's just like, you got to be able to orderly, you know, walk through the process. Because we all have a story. Sometimes you say, well, I don't think my testimony is that good. Everybody's got a testimony. Everybody's testimony will appeal to somebody uh, like themselves. Uh, and you never know. Your testimony is the best testimony you can have because it's yours. It's genuine. It's real. Uh, you know, you, it's so much more effective to be able to say, this is what God did in my life, as opposed to, I once heard a story about a guy <laughs> Because they know you, uh, and they understand the changes that, uh, that God has made uh, in, uh, in your life. And you would be surprised how God can, can uh, orchestrate events to place you in people's lives 
where your own testimony is exactly what they, they need to hear. But you have to have kind of thought it through ahead of time, how to deliver it, how to give that, uh, that testimony uh, to them. I, I, can, I, I think I've told it before, I remember we were doing, helping with one of the uh, outreaches out in, in Waianae, you know, that uh, Francis was doing, the Jesus Loves You, and, uh, you know, big uh, outreach to the, uh, the homeless out there, as well as anybody that shows up, we do a big kinky carnival, and then the carnival would stop, you know, about every 40 minutes, and, and other kids then would get up and share the gospel to the kids, which was pretty cool, because they did yo-yos or whatever, you know, they'd do some little thing, and, you know, our girls went out and would do hula, uh, and then uh, we would do follow-up, and I'm just uh, in the gym on the side, uh, and just in case anybody's got one of those questions, they're going, ah, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to get back to you, that maybe I can supply it. So I'm just kind of chilling over on the side, and I know this big local guy, <coughs> so I, went, I just went to shoot breeze with him, and um, I talk, oh, you know, kids, grandkids, oh yeah, yeah, my, my kids are over there, and they're, they're talking to those guys, and I said, oh, well, you know, I just... Why not? It's what I'm here for. Well, how, how about you? You know, if uh, I mean, you, you heard what uh, what uh, Francis said out there about the gospel. Have you ever, you know, received Christ? Oh no, you don't know me. Well, you're you're right. You're absolutely right about that. But uh, you know, everybody needs needs the Lord and everything. He goes, yeah, but you know, I got it. I got a I got kind of a, a drug problem. So you know, it's kind of a problem. I say, you know what? Me too. I had a drug problem for years, and the, and the Lord delivered me. I came to faith in Christ. It wasn't overnight. It was over a process, but I haven't done drugs in 25 years. God can change your life. Yeah, you know, I, I don't have a house to live in. You know, we're, we're kind of homeless living on the tent. Where? Do you live in Makaha, or you live in Nautakuli, where you live? And he's like, well, we live in Nautakuli. I used to live there. I used to live there on the beach in a tent. You? I said, you live there? Yeah, I was homeless there. Remember the drug thing? You live I was you. I know I'm holy, but I was you, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I got kind of problems because, you know, I've already got a divorce, and that's my daughter from the other marriage, and that's my daughter from the girlfriend, and da, da, da. I go, I was divorced. You were divorced? Yeah, twice. This is my third marriage, but it's a good one, over 30 years. <laughs> really? And this just goes on. Everything this guy had, I mean, every reason why he couldn't, couldn't pray to accept the Lord. I didn't plan this. I just walked over to say hi. And I go, you got anything else? He goes, I got nothing. Why don't we pray? I like to pray, Pastor. <laughs> the guy prays and receives the Lord. You never know. You never know. They're not a good past testimony. Bad testimony. We just have stories to tell. But we kind of have to think it through because sometimes we've only got 90 seconds. And sometimes only five minutes. Sometimes we do have that hour and a cup of coffee. And, but, but think through how to, how to present your story to someone. Peter did that, uh, and he was ready. Uh, and then, of course, his final act uh, is the announcement uh, that Jesus is Lord. Uh, and again, this took courage, and it took tremendous uh, conviction for him to stand up and give these reasons, because he didn't know. As far as he knew, <laughs> this was his first and his last sermon. Maybe that's why he made it a good one, you know? Uh, you're going to get one shot at this. You know, as far as he knew, they were going to take him out and crucify him the next day. Uh, but he was still willing. He never compromised the truth. Never compromised the truth of, of, of the gospel. Uh, he was courageous. This Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then lastly, he asked for a decision, as, as I mentioned. Uh, and sometimes we fail to do this. But just ask. Is there any reason why you're not willing to pray to receive Jesus Christ right now? You'd be surprised. You know, a lot of times people just say... No, I, I can't really think of a reason. Or if they give a reason, that, well, now you've got something to, to, to work with. Uh, you know, you, you'll just be amazed. And uh, in the right setting, uh, the Holy Spirit working in people's lives, he can use us to, uh, to uh, lead others to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And I can tell you this, once it happens, your life will never be the same again. Your Christian life will never be the same again. Because now... Now, as a Christian, you've kind of moved beyond your deal uh, and your uh, issues and everything, uh, and your heart is more concerned about other people and their eternal destiny, and you tasted it a little bit. I just lived for the reason God created me. And there's something pretty awesome about that. God wants to use us. Again, we're only the, we deliver the mail. You know, we can't, we can't save anyone. Uh, it's a work of God. 
but he wants us to be able to deliver the message. It's, it's a pretty awesome message. God loves you. And he's got an awesome plan for your life. And he'll forgive you of anything. And it's really simple. You just place your faith in him. Uh, it's an awesome message that we have to deliver. And, uh, and Peter gives us a great model here on how to do that. You must.